God actually begins to raise the dead places in our lives in this life, starting here, starting now. Turning your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. We're continuing our series that we're calling Where's the Church? And uh, in light of tonight's big game, I thought that I would, or apparently God thought, that he would uh, teach me something uh, about football. Uh, the sermon this week just gave me fits. The staff know it all week long. I was like, this just isn't flying. This isn't flying. Had some things <clears throat> this week that I need to give attention to. And so last night at uh, 10 o'clock, God called an audible. Uh, if you know what the big game is tonight, both quarterbacks, they'll get up to the line. They'll have called a play in the huddle. And something doesn't look right on the defense. Maybe they've got the wrong play called. And the quarterback calls what is called an audible. In other words, he shouts out a number or a color, and everybody's alerted, and he changes the play at the last second. Well, God pulled an audible on me last night, and so nothing in your program except for the text is actually what we're going to cover. So, let's see uh, where this goes. Let's stand out of reverence for God's Word. This is actually, this is only the third time in 29 years this has happened. Uh, the first time was 9-11. It's changed everything up that week. Uh, then the tornadoes several years ago changed everything, scrapped the sermon. But this is the first time in 29 years that uh, there was actually no reason that I know of that God scrapped the sermon. So who knows what he's up to. Uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. And as they were speaking to the people... The priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, by which we must be saved. May God bless the hearing and teaching of his inspired, infallible, inerrant, and authoritative word. Let's pray together. Father, uh, you know the agony of soul that I have undergone. Lord, we need you. We need you every week, even when I feel confident of what you've spoken and confident in my preparation. Lord, Nothing could be further from the truth right now. And so, Holy Spirit, I'm particularly aware of my desperation. So lead me and guide your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and take a seat. So the audible uh, is actually called by God in this text, too. In chapters 3 and 4, Peter and John are going up to the temple at the time of prayer So they're planning on praying. God calls an audible. There's a man who's lame, and Peter heals that man. They're no longer on their way to the temple now. Now they're all wrapped up in the people that are amazed and astonished over a miracle. Such a large crowd gathers. Peter preaches 5,000 people the church now grows to. 5,000 men. So that could be 10,000 people. I mean, this is incredible moving of the Spirit in Jerusalem. It gains the attention of the chief priest, 
the priestly family. Actually, it gains the attention of the exact same people who tried Christ. And Peter, who was near these people just a couple of months ago, when he denied Christ, is brought before the same people. But this time, he not only doesn't deny Christ, he stands up in boldness and preaches that the one they killed is the only one who can save the world. So the first thing I want us to see here is that if you're hoping for change, Jesus is the one you need to come to. I I said this morning, what is it in your life that you're sick and tired of giving into? I I hope you have something in your mind. Temptation, sin, brokenness, fear, whatever. What is it in your life this morning, like Rosa Parks, you're sick and tired of giving into? Peter had that as well. Peter clearly was a people pleaser. He was impetuous. He would stand up and say things like, if everyone else falls away, Jesus, trust me, I won't let you down. By the way, even though he stands up here, it clearly continued to be a problem for him because we read in Galatians 2 that Paul had to publicly rebuke Peter. You see, Peter had the vision that in Acts chapter 10 we're going to get to uh, where the unclean foods came from heaven and Jesus said, Peter, arise, kill, and eat. And in one of the greatest oxymorons known to humanity, Peter says, no, Lord. If he's Lord, you don't tell him no. Get that? He says, no, Lord, no unclean food has ever touched my lips. And Jesus said, Peter, what I've declared clean, no longer consider unclean. So Peter has this vision. It's not like there's any doubts in his mind other whether he can eat pork or shrimp. So in Antioch, Peter is eating Jim and Nick's with the Gentiles because he knows he can. Then Jews come, and there's a huge division between the Jews and the Gentiles, especially among the Christians. Some of the Jews are saying, you need to actually follow the law of Moses. You need to follow the dietary laws as well if you really want to be embraced by God. And Peter, who was a people pleaser still, didn't stand up, and he stopped eating Jim and Nick's. And he stopped eating with the non-Jews. And as a result of him not standing up boldly for grace, many people's faith was wounded. You see, we all have those areas where we sometimes experience victory and then we fall into defeat. What is that area in your life? And in this passage, we see the hope for change. Where did the change come from in Peter's life? Well, look at verse 2. Peter was proclaiming the resurrection. Now, listen, that's not just the resurrection of Jesus. See, if you think the Christian life is simply giving intellectual assent that Jesus raised from the dead, you do not yet understand your faith the way God means you to. Proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead is not merely proclaiming the fact that Jesus rose. It's believing that when Jesus rose, Jesus set into process a constant turning back of death in the lives of his people. A constant renewing of the lives of his people. A new nature with a new spirit with new priorities, with new agendas, with new loves and new desires. We find out in 2 Corinthians 5 that if any person is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. 
the old has gone, new has come. And one of the first, I guess, elements of confidence in facing your brokenness and your sin is to realize that we believe in Jesus, we proclaim the resurrection, not just the fact of his resurrection, but that every single day as we surrender our hearts and our lives and our wills to God, he makes us alive and we can be changed. I think sometimes we talk so much in the church about our depravity and our brokenness and our sin that we can lose sight of the fact that there's hope of living a different life tomorrow than we live today. If you're a Christian, there's hope that you can be a different husband or wife tomorrow than you are today. If, If you're a Christian, there's hope that you can be a better mother or father tomorrow than you are today. If you're a Christian, there's hope that you can live differently tomorrow than you do today because Jesus Christ has been raised. And it's not just the fact of his historical resurrection that matters. It's believing that his resurrection set into movement this process of continual renewal of our human lives. Are you trusting in the resurrection power of Christ to make you new again every day? The second element that changed Peter's life is found in verse 8. Peter filled with the Spirit. Peter directed and controlled and empowered. Listen, it's, it's not just believing truths that changes your life. Supernatural things take place. When you trust in Christ, you actually receive the Holy Spirit of the living God. You have a power within you that nobody else has if they don't know Christ. And that spirit is able to change you. That spirit is able to prompt you. That spirit is actually able to give you the power and the desire to overcome sin. See, one of Peter's greatest problems before the cross is he didn't have the Holy Spirit. Nobody did. And Peter was relying entirely on himself. Self-sufficient self-reliance, and that is the cause of many people's failure in the Christian life. Even though you have the Holy Spirit, you're living a life of self-sufficient self-reliance. I'm amazed at how many people just think the Christian life is following the New Testament Scriptures. Here's what it says, just do it. And I promise you, if you try that, you will fall flat on your face. The Christian life involves a conscious, intentional, moment-by-moment, desperate dependence upon the reality of the power and presence of the Holy Spirit of the living God. And if you are not consciously, intentionally dependent on the resources of the Holy Spirit, you will, in fact, fall flat on your face. And that was Peter's problem. Lord, though everyone else denies you, I will die with you. Right? Completely self-sufficient. And some of you are hearing the rooster crow constantly, exposing your sin because you're living a life of self-sufficient self-reliance. But there was another reason that Peter was changed. Look at verse 13. The people recognized that he and John had been with Jesus. Now, they'd actually been with Jesus for three years. But when did they really learn who Jesus was? No, not until after the crucifixion and the resurrection. Then they really, really, really knew who Jesus was. Do you know who Jesus is? 
I'm not saying like, you know, he's a historical person from Nazareth who lived a life, did miracles, died on the cross, rose from the dead and ascended to heaven. I'm not saying if you know that. I'm saying, do you know Jesus? And are people astonished when they're around you because they recognize you have been with Jesus? Really been with him. Been with him in his word. Been with him in prayer. Visited him at the foot of the cross in surrender. If we spend time with Jesus, people will recognize that we have been with Jesus. And Peter, as he was before the same group that just a couple of months earlier, he, he, he had been so afraid of that he denied Christ. He stands up now and says, you crucified this guy. You crucified the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And there is no other name under heaven by which you must be saved. What a difference in this man's life because he had spent time with Jesus. And then I didn't read this this morning, but if you look at verse 24 and following, um, the people begin to lift up their, their, uh, their voices in prayer. And I've said that over and over recently, haven't I? That if we really want to see our lives change, we need to be people of prayer. Now, folks, this is not performance. I'm not saying God's going to love you more if you pray more. What I am saying is that God clearly teaches the promise that if we pray, things will happen. How much in your lives, in your homes, in your careers is not happening? And could it be traced to a lack of prayerfulness? You've turned everywhere for help. You've read all the books, seen all the counselors. And so I just have a simple question. How much have you prayed about it? You know, Christianity is not something we do on Sundays only. Business owners, business leaders, how much do you pray about your vocation? Is, is that like, you know, that's your realm? And the church sort of is God's realm? You know, I love uh, golf, and not only is it Super Bowl tonight, but the, the 2018 PGA Tour has kicked off as well, Professional Golfers Association. And for people who are really bad like me, uh, there's something called a mulligan. Uh, a mulligan is, I don't know where it originated, nobody really knows, but um, if you're on the first tee and you hit a really bad shot off the first tee, you're just allowed to hit another one. It's like, you know, grace golf. It's, it's a mulligan. It's a freebie. Uh, now, there's different approaches to mulligans. Uh, some people, if they don't use it on the first tee because their first swing was pretty good, then they put it in their minds as a traveling mulligan. So you didn't use it on the first tee, but, you know, there may be a shot that comes along that goes into the woods, and, well, you just don't want to lose a stroke, so you lay down the mulligan, right? And then, and I've been with some people, they create mulligans. Well, like, this is my first par three mulligan, you know? So they've got mulligans all throughout the entire game. Okay, uh, clearly last night I, I needed a mulligan. I, I needed a do-over because the message just wasn't coming together. Peter gets a mulligan right here. The same people that caused him to fear so that he denied Christ, he appeared before again. God gave him a mulligan, a do-over. What's the mulligan God's giving you this morning? A do-over. The grace Christian life. And recognize the power of the resurrection, the fullness of the Spirit. Spend time with Jesus and lift your voice to God in prayer. Hope for change. And then secondly, hope for boldness. Uh, there, there are three times in this passage the word boldness is written by Dr. Luke. Verses 13, 29, and 31. Peter preached boldly. 
they prayed for boldness, and then they went out and spoke boldly. In verse 12, Peter speaks boldly. There's no other name. You know, this is where people get uncomfortable, isn't it? When we talk about Jesus as being the only way. And sometimes I think the church is a little embarrassed by that. So let me make sure we're clear. Folks, there's not a plan B. You, you, you can't think about the people, for some reason we always just say Africa, so let's stick with that, who've never heard and say, well, there, there must be just a plan B. No, there's not. There is no other name by which people must be saved than Jesus. And in Romans, Paul couldn't be more clear. How can they call upon him whom they have never heard? And how can they hear unless someone is sent to preach? There is no plan B. Church, Jesus is the only way to life. And apart from people hearing the gospel, there is absolutely no way for them to receive life. So God calls us to step out in boldness. And God calls us to engage in mission. At the end of the month, we have our Global Missions Conference. Missions is absolutely essential because there isn't a plan B. People who do not hear are lost. And people who turn to other religions are lost. And when we say that, we don't say that with arrogance. We say that with a tear in our eyes and our hearts breaking. And we don't say that because we think we're better than everybody else. We're not. But the truth is the truth. There is no other name by which we can be saved. And then in verse 19, we see another element of boldness for Peter. The same boldness that Rosa Parks showed on that bus in Montgomery. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you be the judge. What is there in our culture right now where people are asking us to listen to the government or to the culture rather than listening to God. I think of the abortion issue. I think of the sexuality topic that is rampant in our culture right now. I think of how people simply say, church, you can be the church in your four walls, but don't you dare bring it out into the public square. And Christians have been made to feel like we're being offensive if we talk about Jesus. Now listen, we are never supposed to be offensive in how we live as far as our attitudes as far as the, the way we speak, we're never supposed to be offensive. Matter of fact, we're to go out of our way that nothing in the way we carry ourselves is offensive. But the gospel will offend. It will. And don't allow the world to tell you whether it is right for you to talk about Jesus. Jesus. Don't let the world tell you whether it is right for you to follow God or not. And then again, in verses 24 to 29, we, we just can't get rid of this idea of prayer. If, if someone were to ask me, what is the one thing that is different about the first century church as compared to the contemporary church, I could answer you in a heartbeat. They prayed. They prayed all the time. They really believed prayer mattered. And then I want you to look at the difference of their prayers and our prayers. Okay, in verses 24 and following, 
they pray, Lord, take note of their threats and enable us to be bold. Now, do you sense anything different about their prayers and how we pray? Let me tell you how we tend to pray. Lord, take away my enemies. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't be opposed like this. Jesus, protect me. There's none of that. It's God. Give me boldness to proclaim Jesus in the midst of a hostile culture. Do you see the difference? It's like we're consumed with our comfort and they were consumed with Jesus. We're consumed with the good life and they were consumed about proclaiming the gospel. And folks, it's not because they were better than us. I think it's because they prayed. And we know we should pray. And we talk about prayer. But we so rarely pray. I was so encouraged this past week. Several weeks ago, I preached on prayer during our week of prayer. And one of the things I said that I hope really stuck was, uh, what will change your life is a prayer group. And I said, either join a prayer group or form a prayer group. And I've been so encouraged to hear a number of ways that people have decided to take me up on that. And there are new prayer groups being formed in this church on a weekly basis. And I said to a friend the other day, if that keeps on, we're going to see change in our lives. And we're going to see change in our church. And we're going to see change in our city. Prayer changes the world. So, that's one of the ways that we practice boldness. By praying for boldness and not praying for comfort. So, hope for change. Hope for boldness. And then lastly, Hope for a response. I want you to notice the different responses of people in this passage. And the hope here for me is that we keep on engaging. What's our mission at Oak Mountain? Engaging every neighbor with the surprising power of grace over the fence of our neighbor's yard, over the mountain into the city, and overseas, right? Keep on engaging even those different responses. Look at verse 2. Some of the people were greatly annoyed. Please don't be surprised if people get annoyed with you. It doesn't mean you've done it wrong. Now, if you've done it wrong, then ask God to change you. In other words, if you've been angry, if you've been unloving, if you've been unkind, if you've been self-righteous, if you've been holier than thou, then of course, repent and ask God to change you so that you're not offensive. But some people are just going to be annoyed. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, let them be annoyed. Then look at verse 4. A bunch were converted. There's going to be fruit when we engage our neighbors with the surprising power of grace. 5,000 men, the number of the church grew to. And then look at verse 13 and verse 16. These are amazing verses. Some were astonished as they listened to Peter preach, but they weren't converted. Do you realize that you're going to be around people and you're actually engaging them very well? And they're actually going to be astonished, but they're not going to care. Don't be surprised when that happens. And then look at verse 16. Some were absolutely hardened. They actually, they actually say, we can't argue. There's a miracle here. So let's tell them not to talk anymore in the name of Jesus. Are you kidding me? They actually acknowledge a miracle. 
They actually say, this man was lame, and now he's walking and leaping and praising God. We better tell them not to talk anymore in this name. How could you be so clueless? Well, what it reminds me of is that the gospel isn't a matter of the intellect. It's a matter of the heart. Jesus said, when, when people said, well, show signs, Jesus says, if they don't believe my words, neither will they believe my signs, neither will they even believe if someone is raised from the dead. People don't ever forget. Engaging the gospel, engaging your neighbors with the gospel is not primarily an intellectual enterprise. The heart has to be changed. And you could raise the dead in a group of your friends, neighbors, work associates. And unless God moves in their heart, they will not be saved. Newsweek said that 84% of Americans believe in miracles. And yet they live in denial of the greatest miracle that has ever happened. Jesus makes lives new. Jesus wants to change you more than you want to be changed. Jesus wants to make you bold. He wants to enable you to live the way God calls you to live. He wants you to speak with boldness. But all we can do is offer grace. Jesus makes us new. Augustine lived an immoral life before he was converted. And once he was converted, he was in a town square, and there was a woman who saw him with whom he'd have, had an immoral relationship. And she cried out over the, over the square, Augustine, Augustine, it is I, it is I. And Augustine looked at her and started running. And as he ran, he screamed, it is you, but it is not me. It is not I anymore. Jesus changes lives. Jesus changed Augustine. Jesus changed Peter. Jesus has changed me. And Jesus longs to change you. And he longs to change your sphere of influence. Will you spend time with him? Will you walk in dependence upon the Holy Spirit? Will you be a person of prayer? And oh, by the way, Jesus wants to make you all of those things. Just keep going to him in repentance and faith. Let's pray. Father, uh, thank you for the book of Acts. Thank you for uh, the case study of Peter. And Lord, we do again surrender ourselves to you, relinquish our agendas, our plans, our priorities to you. We ask you, Jesus, come and change us. If there's anybody here who does not yet know Christ, might you speak to their hearts right now? There is no other name under heaven by which they can be saved. And might they put their hope in the promises of grace. And Lord, might we hope daily that we can be different tomorrow than we are today because of your grace. Thanks for all the mulligans you give us in life. And thanks for the way that you call audibles every day of our lives. In Jesus' name.